when did you kind of say to yourself, what am I going to do in the rainforest? And how did that initial idea snowball into a 70 person (laughs) international hefty research experiment? So I actually thought about it quite a bit and just, you know, thought about how this would fit into the broader research that I envisioned happening in my group. And in that process, I talked to a lot of people who have already been involved in research in Biosphere 2 or who were, you know, colleagues I really look up to at University of Arizona and uh, got a lot of different types of advice. But one piece of advice that I really appreciated was to consider taking on the rainforest and immediately running a campaign. So I took that advice and that same person actually was coincidentally in Germany for someone's retirement celebration and at that very meeting Christiana Werner was presenting on her uh, research under this European Research Council grant and had uh, started talking about how the final phase of that grant was to come to Biosphere 2 in the rainforest and conduct what they had been doing on the, the branch scale and the, the small planted pot scale and scale it up to the entire ecosystem under glass and that she was planning to come here, you know, to Biosphere 2 to finish that part of her grant. And so I I connected with Christiana, and as soon as we started inviting people, I think they just saw how unique the system was and the opportunity would be to come together and answer questions in a really, like, synergistic way in a really unique system that I think just inspires, you know, extra curiosity in already curious people. You consider yourself an ecosystem genomicist. What is that, and and how is is that being explored within the B2 Wild project? So to me, ecosystem genomics is using genomic tools and ecosystem science tools to understand more about a system than you can from either one alone. And so we know that in an ecosystem there are plants, there are microbes, and they do certain things. But if we don't recognize that they have genomes that can evolve and interact, then we may um, miss some important feedbacks that are then again you know, important on the ecosystem scale. And likewise, if we were to just study microorganisms and their genomes uh, alone out of the ecosystem context, we might Uh, predict that they would behave in a way that's very different than they do in complex communities and in association with plant and under environmental stress. And so to me, ecosystem genomics is really trying to merge these two different disciplines who come from sort of a bottom-up approach and a top-down approach and bring them together to really better predict how ecosystems across the world um, behave, how they'll change over time, how we might manage them in recognition that they are composed of life forms that have genomes and that has this like really special information in the blueprints of those genomes that we might get a little bit more understanding from than if we sort of treat them as non-dynamic components of the ecosystems. What about Biosphere 2 and kind of the controllability of the rainforest ties in with actually seeing genomics play out? Mm -hmm. Uh, in response to this drought that you have planned. Mm -hmm. Does turning the knobs make it easier to see some of those uh, uh, genomic signatures? I think so. I think turning the knobs makes it easier to see the signatures and to do it like year after year after year if we want to, to really make sure that it, it wasn't a fluke, that it wasn't an anomaly, that we're really seeing reproducible responses. And so that in some ways it's a model. And like a computer model, you could rerun the same simulation over and over again. And I feel that we can do that here in a way that we can't do in our, you know, our natural field sites. Um, and to me as a, you know, an atmospheric chemist turned ecosystem genomicist, the atmosphere of Biosphere 2 is so sensitive to the biosphere because it's more shallow, it's really like a very intimate connection between the life and the atmosphere within the system. And so I think the responses can just be so much stronger, you know, and we've seen that in past studies. We've seen that during closure, that there's just this very tight connection between the biosphere and its activity in the atmosphere. And so really, like, the signals are just so much larger for us that we can develop understanding in a, in a, in a place where you know, the the patterns are much more clear, and then we could go back out to a number of different types of ecosystems in the, you know, in the outside world and, and test if we see those same mechanisms in, in those systems. And so I think it's this really neat tool that's somewhere between a model and, like, a laboratory study, but that still is, you know, it's a really an ecosystem with complex, comp, you know, relationships between the microbes and the plants and all the physical components. 
the B2 rainforest is in some ways a bit of a patchwork where it may not contain every single species or every single animal or insect or, or player in the larger kind of natural ecosystem, but are there ways that that patchwork actually becomes an advantage uh, where you might be able to see something or kind of identify a relationship uh, between a couple of species that you wouldn't otherwise potentially see? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think so. I think like the models that we use to predict climate, not everything is re represented, you know, in the Biosphere 2 rainforest or in the other ecosystems in the same way that we find it in the natural world. And in, in models, maybe those things aren't represented because we don't know how the mechanisms, like what those mechanisms are, or we just have no context for defining the parameters or we deem it unimportant. Um, and so I think this is another model that I think represents really critical interactions in ecosystems that many people care about. And will, of course, you know, some things will be absent. But I think that that just allows us to make sure that if we see a relationship between an environmental r pressure that we control, we control that knob, and a response and some coupling between soil, plant microbe, atmosphere that we you know can can attribute that and and we could layer on later the complexity of adding more animal animal life or something but i think it's nice to start with something that is complex yet reductionist and that is really the way that we study and represent the world in our models in any case so yeah i think it's it's a model system and and we can learn learn a lot from model systems all of the scientists that are working on different components of this forest uh, there's still only so much time in a day. So how do you balance the objectives of scientists from different fields with uh, things like limited sampling time, um, limited species, um, and space, too? Mm -hmm. uh, when, you, when you design a project like this, how is that playing out? And what are you learning about these like massive collaboration efforts? Yeah, I think... I mean, I think... in on one hand, just thinking about this question makes me realize like what an amazing team we have. We have a lot of people who are really passionate about interdisciplinary science and about learning about different science. And not only, you know, for me, it's not just the scientific outcomes of this specific study that are exciting to me. To me, it's like acquisition of whole new fields of understanding. Like I'm learning about how different people in different fields take their samples, what the things are that they care about, what is the state of art in that field and thinking of new ways to merge disciplines beyond the experiment here. So I think we have a lot of people who already start from like a um, really just a philosophy and a passion, you know, for interdisciplinary science. And we're just excited to learn from each other. And then I think those trade-offs occur, but I guess I think with like quite a bit of creativity and recognition that nobody can do everything we just have come to like a nice balance of respecting different people's needs and trying to find synergy where we can but yeah it's I'm actually kind of surprised with how well it's worked because I think it can be really like a struggle to balance needs of different disciplines maybe some different some disciplines need destructive samples and they need to remove samples from the system and that then you know challenges or thwarts the intentions of another group who needs it to be a perfectly pristine uh, system and I don't know somehow here I think we've just been pretty creative and thought of a lot of ways around that and I would say one of the biggest you know strengths and uh, scientific uh, methods in this in this study is online measurements of gas fluxes and gas fluxes are a really nice way to get a get the pulse of an ecosystem and understand how its atmosphere, its leaves, its tree trunks, its soils, its roots are responding to environmental pressures in a way that's actually not that invasive or destructive. And so I think we're actually able to derive a lot of information about the ecosystem without removing a lot and without doing a lot of destructive sampling. Um, and so already I think we start from this nice foundation of knowledge generation in a in a more um, non-destructive way than than maybe is possible and with some other approaches laura thank you for interviewing with me yeah thanks a lot aaron um i look forward to see how this project unfolds and wish you the best of luck thank you